In terms of the placement of Mr. Chauvin's knee, um, would that explain anatomically why Mr. Floyd, would that anatomically cut off Mr. Floyd's airway? In my opinion, it would not. The knee did not cut off his airway. Derek Chauvin's knee did not, that, that is the exact opposite of what we heard from three other experts on the witness stand who in detail explained how all of that happened. But the man who did the autopsy, the chief medical examiner of Hennepin County, is saying no. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who joins us from Minneapolis tonight. Um, okay, there's a, there's a lot to go through with all of this, but um, this is not what the other three experts were talking about. I mean, I, I remember watching Tobin. In, in great detail, explain how the airflow was cut off by Derek Chauvin. We've had a lot of experts come in first, and we can now see where the state is going with this. They wanted these experts to come in to testify specifically about asphyxiation, about the fact that the fentanyl levels were not fatal, and also that the airway, oxygen, the uh, victim in this case could not breathe because of that restraint and because of that pressure on his body. But today, the Hennepin County Medical Examiner, the unavoidable witness, he's the one who did the autopsy, so he has to be called. And today he took to the stand and he kept with his autopsy and what his findings are that are likely more neutral than the state would like because they need those words of asphyxiation and cutting off the airway. But Andrew Baker today on the stand, he skirted around those findings by saying he's not a pulmonologist. He's not someone who would know about oxygen levels inside someone's lungs. So based on what he did during the autopsy, that was his finding. But he's the chief medical examiner, right? This, he's the one who actually did the autopsy. And in every other case that we cover here on Court TV, it's the medical examiner who, who prosecutors rely upon. It seemed to me like the prosecution was minimizing the medical examiner today and, and wanting the jury to think much more about the other experts who testified about the issue of cause of death and not relying necessarily upon the medical examiner for how and why George Floyd died. Well, we could see that even today with the contrast with the first witness who took the stand, Dr. Lindsay Thomas, who was also a forensic pathologist who used to work for the Hennepin County Medical Examiner or used to be here in Hennepin County as a forensic pathologist. So same position, worked under Dr. Andrew Baker. She said at the beginning of her testimony that she was friends with him and knows him. But her findings were markedly different than his in that she found that the cause of death was asphyxiation and a lack of oxygen oxygen getting to the brain, low oxygen levels in the body. She also used words like anoxic seizure, saying that she saw a brain twitch. Another thing I found that was very different about her testimony is at the very beginning, she said that she had to look at the videos to understand the cause of death, and she couldn't get to cause of death or understand what the true cause of death was just by looking at the autopsy. So the autopsy that Andrew Baker put together and put his findings in was not enough for that first expert, the forensic pathologist, Lindsay Thomas, to make a determination. And we know Andrew Baker said at the beginning of his autopsy that he was not going to look at the videos while performing it because he didn't want to be influenced. This is, let's bring in our guests. We've got a lot to get through uh, here off the top of the show, but, but joining us tonight in Orlando, Florida, criminal defense attorney. He represented George Zimmerman successfully along with a lot of other clients. Marco Mara is back with us and in Atlanta, Georgia, Superior and State Court Judge, the Honorable Judge Gino Brogdon. Uh, great to have you both here. Um, I want to put something up on the screen for both of you. Uh, and this is the amount of time the prosecution uh, was on direct examination of some of their experts, including the medical examiner today. Let's take a look. You've got uh, Dr. Lindsay Carroll Thomas, a forensic pathologist, one hour and 29 minutes on direct. The Hennepin County Chief Medical Examiner, Dr. Andrew Baker, 50 minutes, 50 minutes. And then Dr. Martin Tobin, a pulmonologist who talked about cause of death, two hours and 27 minutes. Mark O'Mara, have you ever seen a case where prosecutors have downplayed and minimized the findings of the chief medical examiner? 
Well, here's one. And then there are others. And those others are where it doesn't fit in perfectly with the theory of the prosecution. And again, this has to be unpacked. There is a lot to it. I don't think that Baker, Dr. Baker came in and and did any damage to the state's case. I really don't not. But we do need to understand that Jerry Blackwell, very good lawyer, and he set the cadence of this case. He decided how to do it. And he put in all of his other witnesses, all those other experts to get all that information out because, you know, you have that bias as a juror, what you hear and you like, you hold on to. And then with Baker, he did sort of minimize it. But Baker did bring out some of the evidence that the state needed. But I agree, he did not, he was not hook, line, and sinker for the state. But again, all in all, with all of the evidence and all of the other experts, I don't think that Baker's going to hurt the case, but does give the defense a little bit of room to play. And all they have to do is convince a few jurors that is not an airtight enough case as the state's presenting. Well, Judge, I, I can hear Eric Nelson's closing argument already. I hear it. The chief medical examiner gave his opinion, ladies and gentlemen. Prosecutors didn't like it, so they went out and hired three other experts to say what they wanted to hear. I mean, usually prosecutors like me, we say that about the defense. We don't say that about the prosecution. Well, Vinny, you're right on point, and obviously you were a great prosecutor because you want to come strong even when you've got weak evidence. Now, this was very skillful, what the prosecutors did with this medical examiner, because they bookended him with two of their strong experts. It would have been too big of a hole to not call it. Now, he wasn't all bad for them, but he did give a hesitation about this cause of death thing. And keep in mind that the defense lawyer is simply looking for a sliver through which reasonable doubt can creep. The, the prosecutors in this case knew that the medical examiner was going to give some good stuff, but then the bad stuff the jury might pause about. So they had to have someone strong in front of him and someone strong after him so that whatever bad stuff he had would be hidden some. I thought it was very skillful. Skillful, but again, he's the, he's the medical examiner. I mean, he's the one who does the autopsies and prosecutors always rely on. That, to me, it's, something doesn't feel right here. Let's take a listen to more of Dr. Andrew Baker on cross-examination here, talking about the toxicology. Do you recall having a conversation with Hennepin County prosecutors about the significance of the toxicology findings? I recall having the conversation. I don't recall the specifics of it, but I'm certain that I would have relayed the toxicology findings to them. Do you recall describing the level of fentanyl as a fatal level of fentanyl? I recall describing it in other circumstances. It would be a fatal level, yes, in other circumstances. And you all, do you, would you agree that one of the causes of the pulmonary edema that you communicated to the county attorneys was also fentanyl. Fentanyl can certainly be a cause of pulmonary edema. Um, as I indicated earlier in previous questioning, it's confounded by the fact that Mr. Floyd had quite a bit of CPR, and so I find the pulmonary edema much less specific, um, given, given that he survived and made it to the hospital for a period of time. Do you recall telling the county attorney's office that had you found Mr. Floyd under different circumstances, um, you would have determined this to be a fentanyl overdose. So I don't recall specifically what I told the county attorney, but it almost certainly went something like this. Had Mr. Floyd been home alone in his locked residence with no evidence of trauma, and the only autopsy finding was that fentanyl level, then yes, I would certify his death as due to fentanyl toxicity. Again, interpretation of dr drug concentrations is very context dependent. All right, uh, Julie, Janae, weren't there some notes related to all of this? There were, and when I'm hearing that testimony from Dr. Baker, we may see someone on defense being called to corroborate or to challenge what he said on the stand. But there's a note from May 31st or June 1st is what the title of that note is. And it's actually notes taken by someone who was in a meeting with the doctor, along with the attorney general, the attorney general's office, Matthew Frank was there. And the notes from what Dr. Baker was saying was that if he were found dead at home with no other apparent causes, this would be 
could be acceptable to call an overdose. Deaths have been certified at fentanyl levels of three nanograms per milliliter, and George Floyd was found to have 11 nanograms per milliliter. And the notes go on to say, I'm not saying that this killed him. So this is someone else writing notes about what Dr. Baker is saying, and he expounded on that today, saying that if there was no trauma, that that is what he would find. The defense obviously wanting to emphasize that point. All right. Um, Mark, uh, remind me about what the, the defense has to do, right? They don't have to prove that fentanyl killed him beyond a reasonable doubt. They just have to say it's a potential, reasonable, alternative explanation for the cause of his death. Am I getting that right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They have to come up with sort of this reasonable hypothesis of non guilt. Well, they don't have to come up with it. And I mean, the medical examiner just handed it to him, didn't he? He did. Uh, he did. Again, I, I think that he equivocated pretty well and tried to do everything he could to minimize the damage he did a year ago when he first wrote that report. Uh, I think you can hear it in his voice, the way that he was pushing back against the defendants or defense attorney's questions. But no, there is definitely now at least a pinhole of light that the defense can look at. And again, with a less compelling case with all the other evidence, Great. But again, this jury is going to have to say that those other doctors who told me about fentanyl having absolutely no reaction or no impact on this particular case, I think it's OK. And I think Blackwell and the prosecution team is going to be able to say, absolutely, we, we like the medical examiner's report. He's right. If found at home without some cop sitting on its body, then yes, fentanyl is the only other alternative. But I don't think it's just that much damage to an otherwise quite strong state case. But I, I think, Judge, that the defendants are going to hire the defendants going to hire some of his own experts who are going to come in. And my guess is they're not going to agree with Tobin, Thomas, and Smock, um, and may agree in part with the medical examiner, but may take it a little step further. You're absolutely right. The defense is going to take any little sliver that they can get and get their experts to fit their theories into that sliver. I, I agree with you, Vinny. I'm a little more worried than counsel was worried about this medical examiner talking about fentanyl being a potential, if, if the, this body had been found in an apartment somewhere, the likely explanation would have been a fentanyl overdose. That could lead some jurors to say, well, maybe he died partly because of the fentanyl and then there's a crack in the cause of death. I think this is a dangerous witness and it may open a door for the defense. He's not to be taken lightly. I, I like some of what he said for the prosecution, but some of that made me a little bit queasy. Yeah, and let's listen to more of Dr. Andrew Baker here talking about cause of death. Now, in uh, Mr. Floyd's case, you listed the immediate cause of death as cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Correct. Mm -hmm. What does cardiopulmonary arrest mean? That's really just fancy medical lingo for the heart and the lungs stopped. The heart, no pulse, no breathing. Mm -hmm. So with respect to the term uh, complicating, am I right in the understanding that this term uh, means occurring in the setting of? Yes. Or, or in other words, cardio, cardiopulmonary arrest occurring in the setting of law enforcement, subdual restraint, and neck compression. Correct. So, Dr. Baker, can you tell us how it is uh, physiologically that the subdual restraint and neck compression uh, caused Mr. Floyd's death? In my opinion, the physiology of what was going on with Mr. Floyd on the evening of May 25th is You've already seen the photographs of his coronary arteries so that you know, you know he had very severe underlying heart disease. Um, I don't know that we specifically got to it, counselor, but Mr. Floyd also had what we call hypertensive heart disease, meaning his heart weighed more than it should. Um, so he has a heart that already needs more oxygen than a normal heart by virtue of its size, and it's limited in its ability to step up to provide more oxygen when there's demand because of the narrowing of his coronary arteries. Now, in the context of an altercation with other people that involves things like physical restraint, that involves things like being um, held to the ground, that involves things like the pain that you would incur from having your, you know, your cheek up against the asphalt, an abrasion on your shoulder, 
those events are going to cause stress hormones to pour out into your body, specifically things like adrenaline. And what that adrenaline is going to do is it's going to ask your heart to beat faster. It's going to ask your body for more oxygen so that you can get through that altercation. And in my opinion, the, the law enforcement subdual restraint and the neck compression was just more than Mr. Floyd could take by virtue of that, those heart conditions. All right, this, the, uh, Julie Janae, um, it's not the knee on the neck cutting off the air, but it's the knee on the back and the, the stress of the situation that is causing him to need um, um, more oxygen and air, and he's not getting it because of the blockages and because of the enlarged heart. This is very confusing. This is very confusing to me, Julia. It's something like what we've heard from the other experts who have testified, who have expanded it from not just the knee on the neck blocking George Floyd's airways, but that he couldn't lift himself up, that his lungs couldn't expand because of the way that he was positioned with his arm in a certain way and the knee on his back and on his neck and in that area. So we were introduced to that through these other experts who gave this pathway for the doctor to then Dr. Baker to now say that it's more about the heart as well. I think that's what's new that we heard today is he really added that element of this was a bad heart, but he wouldn't get to the point that the defense crossed him on. He wouldn't say, but for the knee on the neck, he, George Floyd would have survived. Yeah, they, I mean, he's talking about the heart and the arteries. He's not talking about the air. It's different than what the other ones are saying. This. I don't know what the jury does with this. We're going to talk more about it. Uh, Julie Janae will join us a little bit later on in the program. She's got a lot to go through today with her takeaways. That's coming up. Uh, but Mark O'Mara and Judge Gino Brogdon will stay with us. Uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, what a day in Minneapolis.